Jordan, former Brexit Secretary. Sitting to my left, Christine Jardine, Liberal Democrat MP for Edinburgh West and no longer Treasury spokesperson, but Cabinet Office spokesperson. Tim Stanley is columnist and leader writer for The Daily Telegraph and Jamie Klingler, writer and women's safety activist who's co-founder of the campaign group Reclaim These Streets. Now, we have a new way for you to ask questions on Cross Question. Uh, just say to Alexa, send a comment to LBC. Um, quite a few of you have done this. Um, the one I like so far is it just says, love you, Ian. <laughs> keep, keep them going like that. They're, they're all very nice on Alexa at the moment. So that's... Can we respond to that? No, no, no you really can't. Uh, you can also text 84850, but what we would really like you to do is phone the programme on 0345 6060 973. And, of course, you can watch us, as usual, on Global Player. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. David Davis has his headphones on, so we can continue with Chris in Richmond. Hello, Chris. Um, hi, panel. Hi, Ian. And um, just, just anyone think in the panel that the financial markets will ever again trust this government? Well, that's a very pertinent question at this moment because just breaking in the last few minutes, the Governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, says that the emergency intervention in the bond markets will come to an end on Friday. He tells pension funds, which are heavily invested in UK debt, you've only got three days left now, you've got to get this done. David Davis. Well, I mean, it'll take some time for it to stabilise. And I have to say, as you're pointing out, really, the Bank of England hasn't made it any easier. I mean, both... The, the comments you just made, it the same was last week. They were not giving any uh, indication of ongoing support after after Friday, and that caused instability then. And they've even got a publication on their own website of criticisms of the government by the, uh, by the deputy governor. So it's not actually designed to... Uh, uh, the behaviour of the bank is not exactly designed to create that. But uh, I think that the key point of your questioner's question is that uh, this started with the mini-budget, it, uh, uh, I mean, I'm a tax, I'm a tax cutter myself. But there are ways and ways of cutting taxes, and we're at risk of giving low taxes a bad name by by overdoing it. And that's that's what happened. I think what's going to happen is Quarteng, uh, uh, Quasi is going to have to backtrack a bit, and in due course, it will stabilise. But the, this deadline of Friday, I mean, that that. I mean, given the comments from Andrew Bailey there, mm. I mean, that, that could spark another market crisis, couldn't it? Yeah, I mean, for listeners, what, what's going on, of course, is that pension funds, because of their strategy for dealing with um, defined benefit uh, pensions, have got a whole load of government gilts on their, uh, on their balance sheet, and every time they dive, they've got to find cash to meet the security. And that means they sell more and more gilts, which means they get cheaper, which means they have to sell more and more gilts, and so on. The bank's job is to prop that up. That's it. Well, it's one of its primary functions, maintaining the stability of the financial institutions. And it sounds like Andrew Bailey is walking away from that uh, responsibility, which seems to me uh, really extraordinary behaviour by a governor of a bank. And if you were Chancellor of the Exchequer tonight, would you be phoning Andrew Bailey? And if so, what would you be saying to him? Well, of course, theoretically, they're independent. Um, but in practice, there's always a great deal of traffic back and forth. After all, the bank's staffed largely by ex-Treasury people. Um, uh, and so there will be a lot of backwards and forwards. And I suspect he will have talked to him. You know. uh, truth be told, if I'd, full been, and frank conversation. if I'd been the Chancellor, Andrew Bailey wouldn't be the governor. It's as simple as that, I'm afraid. I would, I would, not, have, uh, I would not have left him in place. Christine Jardine. As a former Treasury spokesperson, yep. you must be quite grateful you're not anymore. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, it's a worry. There's every single day is seems more worrying than the day before. And the key point, um, which the questioner made, was will the financial markets ever trust this government again? And I have to say, I find it very difficult to believe that they will. Because regardless of how the, the Bank of England might have behaved, and um, it is worrying to hear tonight that they're saying, you know, the intervention will end in three days' time. Regardless of all of that, this started with the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the Prime Minister and that mini-budget, which just sent the markets into freefall. It damaged the pound. And, you know, somebody said at the time, you know, the Prime Minister wanted to hit the ground running. Well, unfortunately, she missed the ground. She went into a great big hole and she has pulled our economy after her and trashed it. And that is the problem I think the financial markets are going to have going forward with this government, whether or not they can trust them. 
And the U-turn that they've already made on the tax was, I mean, the first decision was damaging and then U-turning on it. The financial markets, I don't think, can have any confidence in this government. And confidence in the government is the single thing which in many ways is most important to the financial market. Do, do you see any echoes of 1992 here where by the end of that parliament... The, the, the economy was actually doing rather well mm, when yeah. it came to May 1997, mm. but the Conservatives got absolutely no credit for it because the electorate decided that they had lost their reputation for economic competence on Black Wednesday. Now, yeah. in a way, you can't really compare a mini-budget no. to Black Wednesday. No. However, the opinion polls show that people have lost confidence in them. Do, do you think that it's possible to get that back in two years? Um, I think it, I, I think the damage that is being done to the economy and the damage that people are seeing to their own finances and their own worries will make it very difficult for this government to get their confidence back. And I don't think they should get it back because I think they've behaved incredibly badly. And I, I think the parallels... is It's very dangerous drawing parallels, but I see more parallels of the 1970s, actually, at the moment than I do. I mean, we've got the worst um, cost of living crisis since then, uh, the tax burdens that we've faced over the past few years. And I think about now the warnings about power cuts and how we had to face them in the 70s. And I think that my constituency of Edinburgh West um, has a much lower than the national average rate of unemployment and a much lower than the national average rate of claimants. And 58%, according to a recent survey, 58% of my constituents are talking about cutting back on essential shopping, foodstuffs. They're talking, you know, 20% of them are worried that for the first time they might have to go to food banks for help. Now, that's the sort of thing public confidence is not going to be won back easily or quickly when people are going through that trauma. And that's before we go on to the cost of energy. David, you want to come back? Uh, just to say, you, you were conflating two things, the market confidence, which is one thing, oh, yes. and, and public confidence. I think you're right. I think the, the comparison with 92-97 uh, is actually apposite. You know, it wasn't just a reasonable job the Tories did in 97. It was, in the words of Tony Blair's chief economic advisor, the best economy any incoming Labour government had ever inherited. And we got zero credit for it. We were nearly wiped out in the in the polls. So you're right, there is a risk of an ongoing issue there. But the other issue is, is to do with the financial markets. And we should be quite clear about this. There's a lot of trading and money making going on here, playing of the movements in the market. Uh, and that's not just about confidence. That's, that's an exercise, a bit like happened with ERM, an exercise in money making. So don't underestimate that. Sometimes by Tory party donors as well. That may be the case. <laughs> <laughs> that I can't Chris Benody, I'm looking at you. Uh, <laughs> Jamie Klingler. It kind of feels like we're in It's a Wonderful Life and you've got people standing, because people are going to freak out. You're talking yeah. about whether or not you can pay your energy bills and people are wearing jumpers and, and there hasn't really been any help for anybody. Um, the £20 that was taken off universal credit, there's debating... You, you can't say there hasn't been any help, well, given the extent of there was a £150 million yeah, package yeah. that the government announced on the day that the Queen died. Now, they've got no credit for it because nobody remembers it. But you can't say there's been no help. OK, well, I, I'm terrified of the next four months and what's going to happen to my personal bills and I live by myself in, a, in, in an old council state. It's easy, you know, like it's a warm building. I barely ever put on my heat. But it's everyone I know that has never, ever yeah. worried is terrified. OK, Tim Stanley. It's a bit depressing to think that economic policy has to be dictated to by the markets and keeping them confident in you. But nonetheless, welcome to capitalism. And there's an irony here that this is probably philosophically the most pro-market government that we've had for quite some time that did things that it felt were in the best interest of the market and the market rebelled against it. Uh, what the government would say, uh, I suspect, is, look, this is a global problem that we have, and it's actually in part the consequence of a series of governments doing a lot. It, it's the consequence of furlough. It's the consequence of eat out to help out. It's the consequence of that £65 billion package to help people through the winter. You know, the bills are piling up. Uh, you've got a war with Ukraine, which no one on this panel, I'm sure, is against. That's affecting gas supply. You've got all these external factors, and what the government... Have the market's tried to crashed do. after the mini budget. Yeah, mm. Because what the government's tried to do is it has tried to buck trends. Uh, what other governments are trying to do is follow IMF advice, which is, for instance, cut consumption. You've got an energy problem, 
cut consumption and actually allow prices to go up a bit. The government said, no, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to increase supply and we're going to help people with the bills. IMF and, and others say you need to raise taxes, we need to make sure that spending gets right down. The government said, no, 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 we're going to buck that trend because we're heading towards recession because we raise taxes. Our growth is appallingly sluggish. We're trying to do things that others aren't doing. And the result is that Britain is the outlier. Now, will that gamble pay off? I don't know. We none of us know. But the point that the, the salient point is that the market's looked at it and has gone, we don't like what, the fact that Britain's doing this and no one else has. To us, that just looks like Britain is taking an enormous gamble that it can't afford and at some point in the future it's going to have to pay for. And indeed, the IMS report has said, yes, because the mini budget growth will go up slightly, very probably. Uh, but it's going to make it much harder to deal mm -hmm. with inflation in yep. the long run. So that, that's that's what the government would say. The government saying, we are mm. trying to do something different, we're bucking the trends, uh, but markets don't like that, because particularly at this kind of time, with these external factors, markets are very jittery. You see, I, the three of us can remember the 1981 budget, where Geoffrey Howe um, mm. got 364 economists writing to the Times, Not saying that, that he was... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was when you are still at the Treasury. I was still at school. <laughs> 364 <laughs> economists wrote to the Times saying this is the most catastrophic budget ever. But it actually heralded the revival of the economy throughout the 1980s. And so, I mean, my only hope is that everyone's getting something wrong here and that they know something that we don't. But I, I, I have little confidence no, that that no, is look, the case. Look, I mean, you're not, you're not talking, in me at least, you're not talking to a high-tax Tory. I'm a tax cutter by... Well, I'm a tax in, cutter, by, by but instinct. like you, I feel uncomfortable as to what, uh, how they've yeah, done it. Yeah, I just put the counterfactual to you. Ima imagine instead that Kwasi Kwarteng, in, when it got up on, on that Friday and said, right, we're going to cut national insurance, the thing we'll be voting on today, uh, or cancel the increase rather, we're going to we're going to cut corporation, or again, cancel the increase in corporation tax, everything else we're going to leave until a budget in November or whenever, uh, and we're going to do a few things to reduce inflation, you know, try and cut the cost of various um, basics of people's budgets. Those things, the pound would have gone the other way under those circumstances. And, and it wasn't because the differences were huge. We're talking in total differences in uh, a, a few billion pounds, uh, rounding errors in these terms. It was a credibility change. And Tim's right. I mean, uh, a previous, a previous re very wise Treasury Permanent Secretary, McPherson, said what the government forgot was not being in the pack is a dangerous place to be. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what they forgot. And so the risks... But by comparison with the 81 budget, the risk of this budget, it was a smaller impact than 81, but a bigger risk because they're outside the pack. And, and that's, that's what we're now going to recover from, you know. And the markets will stabilise when they don't see profit-making opportunities again. That's what will happen. Um, but, but, you know, as I say, don't conflate the market and the electorate. Um, mm. Two different arguments. And just as yeah, in, the in the case of 81, uh, many, of the, many of those economists insist... You weren't even they born, were, were you? No, I wasn't. <laughs> many, I'm very happy to say. Many of those economists... But he reads his history books. Yeah. <laughs> many, many of those economists uh, insist that they were, in fact, correct, uh, that the budget did indeed do more damage than was strictly necessary. But what that whole exercise was about was about under Howe and Thatcher was restoring confidence. It was about proving that the, mm. the, the government of the United Kingdom would pay its bills and... and, and believed would, in sound money, a phrase in, which so we seem to have forgotten about. It's actually nowadays. the opposite uh, to what mm. is being yeah. done today, which is an, which is an experiment in risk-taking. But to repeat, the government would insist that if we don't do that, we're going to continue with sluggish growth, recession and low product productivity. So they believe that in the long run, to quote Thatcher, there is no alternative to what they've just done. The well, problem is the nearer the nearer analogy mm. is not the eighty one budget, it's the it's the bar bug yeah, dash for growth. In the 1970s. Mm. And that didn't work. Mm. That's yeah. the problem. Which only you remember. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I it's, didn't it's want my, to. my first term in Parliament. <laughs> 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 right, well, it's always good to quote Margaret Thatcher on this com on this uh, programme. Tim Stanley knows how to ingratiate himself. <laughs> so uh, let's move on. We'll come to another question in just a moment. But first, it's 8.16. This is LBC.
Ask Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. <laughs> it's 18 minutes past eight on Cross Question. We have with us David Davis, Christine Jardine, Tim Stanley and Jamie Klingler. They're ready for your calls 0345 6060 973. Um, let's go to a text question from Michael in Chichester. When will our defence spending capabilities and posture match our hard rhetoric? I would expect to see cross-party support for 3% of GDP as a minimum being spent on defence given the Russian threat. Tim Stanley. Uh, I, I, I get that given the current circumstance, there, there is this big push to spend more. Liz Truss did say during her campaign that she wanted to see 3% of GDP spent. And of course, in the last round, uh, the number of personnel actually fell, uh, which is not a good look mm. when you're in the middle of an international crisis. But I have to ask the question, uh, can we really afford this? And is this where we want our spending priorities to lie? Uh, I just, I can't get my head around it. I'm really sorry. The idea... Because the idea, it's an arbitrary figure? Because, because it's an arbitrary figure. We don't like the... So, so Conservatives don't like the arbitrary figure on foreign aid. They didn't like the 0.7%. Mm. That, that was an arbitrary and unreasonable thing because it adjusts from year to year. And I agree with them. Equally, I think the idea that you must arbitrarily stick to one figure on the defence is, is silly. But I also just think right now we probably can't afford to raise it that significantly. Uh, and but I, given the threats that this country faces, surely you, you've got to agree there should be some sort of increase in defence spending? <laughs> I don't... To be honest, I, I really don't know. And I would like to see a case for some sort of reorganisation. I'd like to, someone to come up with a plan that doesn't cost, cost quite so much money. Because, to me, health is a security issue. Education is a security issue. COVID is a security mm. issue. I, I don't... I just find there's this funny thing about conservatives that they wish to cut everything but not only do they want to preserve defence, but they always instinctively want to increase it, as if it's the, the state's one sacrosanct duty is to spend more money on tanks. And I just think... But surely it is. I'll probably the, get the sack Surely the thing. first duty of any government <laughs> is to defend the realm. And it's doing so. Is it? Yeah. We're not, we're not, we were we're spending not currently invaded, of GDP are we? on defence in the 1980s. We're now spending barely 2%. That was post-imperial Cold War posture in which we had to commit military numbers to, for example, the defence of West Germany. At present, that's not the kind of conflict that we face. Right now, it's all about providing supplies and ammunition towards Ukraine. It's about taking part in, uh, it's about taking part in, in exercises in the Baltics. I get that. We might want to expand naval capabilities because the southeast, uh, because the Pacific is going to now be an area of trouble. But it's not about having 200,000 soldiers stationed in uh, Dresden. Mm. Dresden. I don't, I don't see why automatically the Tories always reach for that. Here's the figure. Let's spend. Um, Christine Jardine, I was hearing grunts of agreement coming from my left when, when Tim was speaking there. Well, um, I wouldn't say there were grunts of agreement. I, I think there is a danger in having an arbitrary figure, and I think the danger at the moment mm. is that inflation will mean a, a real terms cut in defence spending, and we have to um, protect against that in a situation where, no, we, we, we don't have troops on the ground and we don't have, as you say, you know, troops in, in Dresden or whatever, but we are facing... Um, a renewed um, threat on the world stage. And we have to re-examine um, how we defend ourselves in the 21st century. And I think um, it's vital that we continue to support Ukraine, stand with our NATO allies and do everything we possibly can. But we have to ensure in doing that that inflation doesn't mean that we have a real terms cut in defence spending when we can least afford it. Because... There's no doubt, and if we're going to talk about age again, I do remember um, the end of the Cold War, and I do remember the threat, and it feels very unsafe at the moment. And I think we have to be very careful before we say that we don't need defence, or that we don't need to ensure that we are we are not cutting our defence when we don't mean to. I should just say that the pound has gone into free fall since Andrew Bailey's <laughs> comments. It's now down to I mean, I'm uh, just about 109. I'm entirely unsurprised. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but if you tank complete... the GDP, the defence spending, yeah. it's tanked as well. Yeah. Jamie. Well, that was that was kind of my whole contribution. 
<laughs> no, but we're we're not in Europe anymore, and so all of this does feel a lot less safe. We're not. Yeah. It doesn't feel like you're wrapped in the arms, and you've got a bunch. We're of wrapped leaders. in the arms of NATO. I mean, yeah, Europe, Europe was never the EU was never a defensive alliance. <laughs> but you're at least having these meetings where you're all talking about what the spending is doing and how you're doing it together, and you're all for one and for one for all, and that feels less strong right now. Um, I, was, I was a Europe minister. They never ever talked about defence in the European Council. Really. Yeah. Barely, you know, it was almost never. So no, it's it's NATO. Ian's right. It's NATO that's the key issue here, not not the European Union. But the, the, this idea of three percent of GDP being spent on defence, but when the, the the Ukraine conflict is ongoing, you can understand why both politicians and members of the public will think, well, that is an entirely reasonable proposition. But of course, when you look at the sums of money that would be involved, it's huge. And, and, and what else they, as Tim was saying, what that what that money could be spent on, in a sense, it comes back to the classic thing, doesn't it? Well, the governments are elected to govern, and they they decide how they cut the money up as to where it goes, and some governments will want to spend 3% on G of GDP on defence. Others won't. But in the end, it will come down to what the electorate want to see. But the electorate didn't put this government in power. So well, let the electorate do. speak. Well, I... I, I get a wee bit tired of this government claiming that they're a new government. They're not. They've just shuffled all the seats. It's the same people. It's the same government. And the problems about low growth that they complain about are problems that they have caused. And I just think we need to stop pretending that this is a new government. It's not. It's the same government we've had since 2015. David Davis, 3% of GDP on defence. Well, let me. I mean, first thing to say is we need to spend enough on defence. Yeah. Three percent may or may not be the right number. It's certainly more than we spend now. But second point: um, part of the problem we're in is that after the Cold War, we had a lot of very clever people, the Francis Fukuyamas and so on, talk about the end of history, and the threats are all gone. No, they're not, and that's what Ukraine is demonstrating. And Ukraine, be and before that, all the other uh, uh, aggressive activities of uh, uh, of Russia from the old Soviet states right across to Syria. Uh, so we need to be across that. Third point is that the Ukrainians are demonstrating that skill and technology are more important than mass, sheer numbers, you know, uh, and, uh, and good generalship. Uh, and we have to learn from that too. Uh, now, that does mean, in my view, I, I used to be, many years ago, I used to be Public Accounts Committee Chairman, every year we would have a set of horror stories about about uh, defence spending, how they'd wasted money right, left and centre. And as a department, they'd do that. Um, uh, what we need to do is think very, very hard about what future wars will think about and prepare for them. That will probably be a lot more than 2%. Uh, it may or may not be 3%. The last element is the political dimension of 3%. Part of our spending levels are important because they help us drive the argument with the other members of NATO. NATO. If we don't spend a certain amount, they won't spend it. Now, they've all got more to catch up than we have. Um, but, you know, us by ourselves is neither here nor there. Okay. We're never going to fight a war by ourselves. It's all of NATO that has to lift the bar. Uh, Michael, thank you very much for that question. Let's move on to Sheila in Dumfries. Hello, Sheila. Hi. Hi, Ian. Thank you for taking my call. Hi, what would you like to ask? Um, I'd just like to ask the panel, um, as a lifelong Conservative voter, I'm 63 now, why on earth should I vote Tory in the next election when you have totally trashed our economy? Well, Christine Jardine would probably agree with you. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, I, 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 Sheila, I do agree with you. I mean, why, looking at what the Conservatives have done now, would you vote for them again? Um, and all I can say is I agree with you. And, you know, I would... Um, well, then I'm biased because I would want everyone to vote Liberal Democrat. Mm. But I do... I do sympathise, actually, with lifelong Conservatives who are seeing their party and their party's reputation um, and everything that they've voted for and everything that they believed in trashed by this government. And that must be very painful to experience. And I'm sure David is, you know, experiencing that on some level as well. And a lot of the MPs will be there sitting there incredulous. You can see it in their faces sometimes at what is being done to their party, party that they believed in, that they've worked for. And I, I mean, I, I do agree, but I do sympathise and feel that it must be heartbreaking for a lot of people 
in this situation now and seeing what this Conservative Party is doing Jamie. to the country and to itself. I think we deserve a right to vote. You know, it's it's 12 years of this and, and, and obviously I'm an American. So when we get new government in it, we get to say. We don't get to just have people put in. And I think we've really... We've had really three needed. elections since yeah. 2010. I know, but you get an entirely new PM without being able to go to a ballot box. 18,000 people voted on this, not me. 80,000. No, 80, sorry. That's still a small, relatively small number. Um, but do you have sympathies for Conservatives who oh. are looking at this and thinking of it as a horror show and thinking, well, I can't endorse this? Absolutely. And I think it's it's there's going to be a revolution of some sorts. And it's going to be with the, with the pensions right now. Like these people who have been secure and felt secure and haven't worried about any of this for their whole lives are all of a sudden yeah. having this call and coming to you and saying, this has been my bread and butter. I thought it was fiscal responsibility was the backbone of conservatives. And now their pensions, their house values, everything else has gone off a cliff. So how do the people that you've trusted for your entire lifetime are letting you down and you're watching it happen and what can we do? So, to the two Conservatives on the panel, uh, Sheila in Dumfries says, I'm 63, I voted Tory all my life, but why would someone like me vote for them again at the next election, Tim? OK, I, I'm not here to speak on behalf of the Conservative Party, but let, let's play devil's advocate here uh, and say, first of all, uh, the only real choice, alternative, is the Labour Party, and it really has no spending plan. I mean, there's no one on this panel to defend it, but uh, I, it's it, what, what it, it doesn't. No, not even a case of its sums don't add up. It doesn't offer sums. It, it really has no financial perspective right now. In terms of the Conservative Party, I, I've noticed, however, that Labour and the Lib Dems have shifted their rhetoric towards... Uh, they, they see Tory voters up for grabs. So they're not saying to them, you are immoral, you're wrong. They're not like saying, like, Nicola Sturgeon, I detest you. What they're saying is, you poor people. You supported this left-wing Tory party your whole life, and suddenly, overnight, it's gone really right-wing. So why don't you come over to us and support us instead? What rot? The Conservative oh, Party on. has always been in favour of hang lower on a taxes. Minute. It's uh, not, well, let me make this it's point. Conservative voters who are saying that. Let be fair. Let it, so, for example, let, let us take the highest rate of tax, which of course was 40p under Tony Blair, and was then put up to 50p. Uh, the last Conservative, uh, the, the Conservative coalition, in coalition with the Lib Dems lowered the highest rate from 50 to 45p. I don't remember much squealing at the time. They were more concerned about the we tax. We raised the tax the threshold was our principle. You raise the tax threshold so right. people in the lowest income yes. get to keep because, more because of the money. The Conservative and you Party, can't blame Liberal it was in Democrats. Is a tax cutting party. But you cannot the Conservative blame... Party was created by God to cut taxes. That's <laughs> what it's here to do. What I'm saying is what I'm saying is this argument this argument this argument this argument the argument that in the last month or so, the Conservative Party has been hijacked by extreme libertarians doesn't wash. My point is, it has cut taxes oh. while in coalition with you. And That's it's, not the argument. And in, in the mini-budget, by far the largest part of it was a bailout to the consumer That's in not, a £65 well, like, billion pound not the argument to Anthony, I get on the according doors. According to Anthony in Greenwich, he thinks Liz Truss is really still a Lib Dem and this is her plan to destroy oh, the Tory goodness. party <laughs> from within. Well, David Davis on that bombshell. Well, that, uh, yeah, that, well, that may be a new, a new rationale for it all. Now, look, now look I am, I am uh, quite, as you know, uh, a, a, a consistent critic of the government on some, some of these areas. But let's just put this back in context for a second. We've had two years, two years of, of COVID paralysis of the economy. We've come through that. We've had the massive disruption of the international energy markets. We've had Ukraine and so on. So, so suddenly you say, oh, well, yeah, they've, they've done all this terrible damage. Actually, they've been managing an incredibly difficult exercise. And as we said earlier, um, they, they now, this new this new regime, as it were, and I'm not sure you call it a new government, but a new, the, the new set in, uh, in charge, uh, have tried a different tactic. We don't know whether it's going to work yet. I don't think it's going to be helped by Andrew Bailey, but we don't know whether it's going to work yet. I mean, it may have a, a, the eye... Why should Sheila vote Conservative mm. again? Uh, this, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to somebody who's younger than me here, so <laughs> Sheila's 63, um, uh, because, uh, but Tim's already made the point, you've got to pick your alternative. Do you want an alternative which is basically a low-tax, pro-growth government, or do you want to uh, or do you want to vote for a party, the Labour Party uh, broadly, uh, who have no plan whatsoever? Uh, it seems to me it's fairly clear. I'd go for one that's got the plan. But let's see, we've got two years to get to that So point, basically you're saying to voters... We are bad. 
we've screwed up the government, no, we've screwed up no, the economy, but vote for us anyway because no, we no, don't... No, I'm saying, I'm, I'm, saying, I'm, saying, I'm saying they've steered... Yeah, I'm saying they've steered... That's well, not yeah, an argument. Partly, but I'm saying they've steered their way through a very, very difficult two years and some incredibly dramatic events, which all governments have found difficult to, to deal with uh, across Europe and America. Uh, and uh, we're, we, are, we are right at the most difficult point, the sort of... Uh, the, the sort of almost uh, a point of inflection. If it works... In two years but time, no one feels like there's a steady hand. No. Like nobody feels like somebody's driving the bus that knows what they're doing. The Everybody original, is freaking yeah. out. And if they are, the cliff edge is quite near. <laughs> yeah. The cliff edge is near. There's no doubt the cliff edge is near. Andrew, Andrew Bailey is pushing us closer well, to I think it. He, I think. he might can't... be on his own personal cliff edge tonight. <laughs> if I was quasi quiet, I, mean, I don't know whether you would all agree with this, but if I was quasi quiet tonight, then I suppose you could argue this would make the situation worse. I would sack Andrew Bailey for those comments because mm. he has precipitated something which we don't know what the end would be. But of course, if he does sack him, that could make the situation mm -hmm. even worse. Any, any, ba any banker would know if you put limits on a yeah. financial intervention, you are creating an opportunity for people to trade against. Yeah. Uh, and that's what causes the precipice. Uh, it's what happened in the ERM crisis. This is precisely what Soros did there and made billions out of it. And what he's done is created a precipice. But what's the justification for Quasi being the only person that made the tax decision? Like Liz Trust going on the news and saying that he made that decision entirely by himself. How does he have that much power in all of that? That's, that's, that's what Chancellors do make those decisions. That's what right. Not with the cabinet? The, the, no, absolutely not. No. But the, the, the Chancellor presents the yeah. budget to the cabinet the day he, the morning he delivers it. That's always been the case this is nothing unusual and you might argue that's the wrong way to do it but it's always been done that way anyway and, we must and the debate essentially consists of questions rather than can you do it a different way because it's too late by that yeah, point because it's yeah. been printed by that point um right we must move on it's 8 34 on lbc keep your calls coming 0345 6060 973 and you have alexa you can say send a comment to lbc and we'll get your question through our screen here it's 8 34 let's get the news headlines from daryl jackson the bank of england governors signal that it will not extend its bond buying support for pension funds beyond Friday's deadline. Andrew Bailey told an event in Washington that funds had three days left to get this done after a series of interventions to support the dysfunctional market in the wake of the government's mini budget. Well, the International Monetary Fund has downgraded its forecast for UK growth next year. The IMF says after improving slightly in the short term, it could fall to 0.3% in 2023. And Buckingham Palace has announced the date of the King's coronation next year. Charles III will be anointed by the Archbishop of Canterbury at Westminster Abbey on Saturday the 6th of May. LBC weather, rain for northern and western areas tonight. Dry and clear to start in the southeast, but cloudier later. Lows of 6 degrees. LBC.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 8.38 on LBC. Some really sad news to impart to you now. Uh, British actress Dame Angela Lansbury has died at the age of 96 at her home in Los Angeles. And of course, she was best known for her role as Jessica Fletcher in Murder, she wrote. And um, George Lansbury, the former Labour leader, leader, was her grandfather, and her father was the Communist Party MP Edgar Lansbury. Um, I don't know how many of you want to comment on this, but I mean, it's, it sort of marks the end of an era, doesn't mm. it, Tim? Absolutely, because she lived so extraordinarily long. And uh, yeah. she was uh, in The Manchurian Candidate, which was about 1960. Mm -hmm. And if I recall my film trivia, she was actually younger than her co-star who played her son. <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence Harvey. <laughs> I just, someone will correct me, but either they were the same age or she's only a couple of years older. But the point is, she always looked the same. Mm. Uh, you must be amazing in a pub quiz. No, no, I'm not at all, because I could be completely wrong. But she mm. always she always looked the same. She had an extraordinary career uh, in theatre, Broadway. I, I mean, she was she was one of the greats. One of the greats. Mm. Mm. I just loved her. And Murder, She Wrote is on, at, like, midnight all the time in America. Yes. You, you can watch it constantly. <laughs> on about 20 different channels. Oh, yeah. yeah. But actually, as Mrs. Potts as well in Beauty and the Beast, and I worked for Jerry Orbach when I was uh, in my 20s, and just she came on once, and they were, like, singing Beauty and the Beast songs together, which was a really special moment. Christine? I think not um, part of the thing. She's different things to different generations. To my daughter, she's the teapot and Beauty and the Beast. To me, she was bed knobs and broomsticks. Yeah. And to, One of the first films I ever saw in the cinema. Yeah, and to a previous generation, she was in the sort of Ealing pictures of the, the 1930s or whatever it was before she went off to America. And I think she went off to the States around about the same time as Julie Andrews. <laughs> and they're of that generation of British actors and actresses. Um, and it, it is an end of an era when I was talking to her earlier on, talking about her <laughs> earlier on, not to her, not to her, that would have been news. Right. I was talking about her earlier on this evening to Alistair Carmichael. Um, we, were, we were talking about somebody who'd been in a film and it got us talking about films, remember, from when we were younger and um, Angela Lansbury came up. David Davis, of course, more of a contemporary of yours. <laughs> <laughs> Almost as old as me, that's right. I am old enough to remember in the Manchurian Candidate. She was wonderful. Yes. I just looked it up. She was 36, Lawrence Harvey was 33, and he played her son. So as I say, she had one of those people who always looked the same age. Something uh, deeply wrong about that, isn't there? But yes. anyway. Right, um, let's move on to another question. It's a text question from Charlotte in Gillingham. Uh, she says, protesters from Just Stop Oil have been blocking roads in London for the last 11 days running, and police have done nothing to move them on, despite them even stopping ambulances and fire engines. How should they deal with these disruptors? Jamie. As somebody who fought the Met over our right to protest and won, um, I do think we have to really think about how important the right to protest is, but also if you're getting the public on side. I think the climate crisis is incredibly, incredibly important, and we all need to pay, pay attention and be on board. But I don't think that the, call, or that the way that they're doing it is necessarily winning people over. And what they need to do is win over people so that there's legislative change and so that people are on side. And I think there was a point where they really got the wave of public support, yeah. but that's long since ended. And I, I would love us to figure out a way to have impact and to absolutely use our right to protest, but do it in a way that... People stand up and listen, and laws are changed, and laws are enacted, and elected officials listen to us. Um, and obviously, I think the right to protest is incredibly, incredibly important. But I think that they've lost the public love or interest in a lot of ways. It is difficult, isn't it? Because, I mean, if you're protesting, obviously you've got to do something to attract media attention. Otherwise, what's the point? You, you don't get covered. I mean, we had one of them, I don't know whether it was from Just Up Oil, sort of glue themselves to this very desk. Mm. Please, please, and then you just switch studios, right? we switch studios but you think well they will they will never be invited on again for having done that so tim please don't do <laughs> he's now glued to um, God, he's, he's got his super glue out <laughs> and, and, and but you're right when extinction rebellion started they were kind of a breath of fresh air they they seem to know how mm. to protest but do you think it's because they sometimes get infiltrated by people who maybe don't have the best interests of that particular movement at heart i think things get overrun protesters. and you get you get extra people and you get different people vying for who's going to get the most attention. And I just think that it's really hard when something reaches critical mass to then change it, you know, and mm. change focus or change force. Because they're like the thing about kids not going to school was incredibly powerful. And they got younger generations hugely switched on to what was going on with the climate. And it was powerful. But now what is what is being said about stop oil? 
nothing. All they're saying is like, oh, we have to reroute this. And you're you're not getting you're not getting the press. You're not getting the press that's on your side at all. The press and the media have been incredibly supportive for Reclaim These Streets mm. and the women's movement because we're doing it in a way that they agree with, you know, and, and that's what it is. It's about getting everyone to make actual change and get it over the line. Whereas what's happening right now, we still have major, major issues to go with climate change. There's no question. But are is this the best route? David Davis, I suspect you'd agree with much of that. Yeah, much of it. The, 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 the truth is, of course, demonstrations, public demonstrations, to some extent, often inconvenience the public. If you get half a million people going through the streets of London, they will inconvenience the public, and the public understand that. But the public also expect them to be law-abiding. Yeah? They, and they may shrug, but they do, you know? And uh, and if it were the point... Which but if the laws are changed to make us not noisy and not be allowed to protest... Oh, well, I agree with that. That's yeah. a different matter. But, but uh, they, they, you know, at the moment, you know, they, historically, uh, there's been lots of times when, you know, policemen have picked up people who are blocking the street and so on, all of that. But if you set out to inconvenience the public on a grand scale, I'd say breaking the law, and B, or will be, if it isn't yet, because we've got another bill going to the House, um, uh, and B, as you say, it loses your, lose, it loses your audience. So it's both counterproductive and wrong. And I, and I have to say, I just, you know, if I'd been in that organisation, I, I would say, don't do this. Let's have a big demonstration. Let's get attention. Uh, let's find ways of getting attention, but let's do it without ruining other people's lives. But, but the, the argument against that is that would organisations like ours, LBC, would we cover something if it was all very peaceful and just went off with sort of 50,000 people marching down the street? The answer is, we probably wouldn't. I think there's a line. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're saying your about the law, like the police told us we weren't allowed to protest and we didn't have a reasonable excuse and didn't do any proportionate review or anything like that for reclaim. And that's when the law is trying to silence women that wanted a moment of silence. And so it's like, they, there has to be there has to be a way to publicly do it that's not okay. gluing yourself. Tim. Uh, Ian, you asked the question, uh, would people cover something if it wasn't so theatrical? Um, but, and yet, to me, the context is a society that has accepted their argument. Surely they're pushing at an open mm. door here. Everyone, Governments are now... Conservative governments are now signed up to net zero targets. So they want things to go much faster. They disagree over the strategy. They favor things like insulation. I agree with them about that, by the way. But they, they have a different strategy. But the irony is, is that they're applying maximum pressure at a point at which the culture is largely on their side. And that's one of just many reasons why many people find them irritating. Uh, because the person who's being prevented from getting to their job actually agrees with them and has already voted for politicians who are already doing that thing. So why are they doing it? Because they want the politicians to do it faster. OK, they want them to go, they do it faster, fair enough, but this is an argument to be had through the ballot box, and you'll have that at the next yeah. election. Okay. Labour will be pledging to do just that. I think we're all singing from the same song sheet here because you don't win the public over by um, putting their lives in danger by making it difficult for ambulances to get to accidents or get yeah. people to hospital. We all would defend the right to protest. It's a fundamental right within a democracy is to protest about things. But you have to draw the line when it's, you know, you're pushing at an open door, it's already been agreed, People are on your side and yet you're protesting. You're, you know, making it difficult for ambulances, emergency services to get through. Why? Mm. When the argument is to a large extent already won. Now, I, like you, you know, I, I was in Parliament the day, probably David, you were as well, the day that the protesters... Almost certainly whenever yeah, it was. Glued, them, <laughs> glued themselves to the, the, the gallery. Yeah. the perspex screen in the gallery, the naked protesters, and that got um, coverage and got publicity and all the rest of it. But we've moved on and people are now frustrated with it because they're not actually protesting. They're just... It feels as if they're protesting for the sake of it and they're putting people's lives at risk and that loses public support mm. and it begins to be difficult to defend. I got into trouble the other way around, probably in your constituency. Oh, uh, probably. During, during the, uh, the, the process of... The Queen's body being brought south, there were some protesters, just one or two. Mm -hmm. I think four actually got arrested by... One the with chief, a blank sign. The, the chief... Hmm? One with a blank sign. Yeah, that's right. And I wrote to the Chief Constable of Scotland and said, you know, 
do you think it's wise to arrest them? You know, is this sensible? And certainly, do you think it's wise to charge them? Because that goes on somebody's record for life. Yeah. It's not, and I point out, said it's not illegal to be a Republican in this country, even no, now. You know, yeah. um, and I thought it was quite interesting. It was interestingly controversial. A lot of Tories were very upset with me. But, uh, but the truth is... Did the Chief Constable reply and tell you to... He's replied in, in very polite terms. Right. And on the thing about, you know, if, if people marched orderly down the street, for even 50,000 of them, would the media coverage... Would the media cover it? Well, I remember the media coverage of the march against Iraq, which was, was perfectly pe peaceful. Kate was a million people, and the coverage of all the marches um, for a second referendum and all the marches against Brexit, they got coverage. They were protests... They weren't violent and they were organised in such a way that they didn't make it, you know, mm. impossible for emergency services to mm. operate. And I think that's the difference that's key. that we okay. have here. Right, we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, if you'd like to phone in 0345 6060 973. It's 849. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player. Here we have 25 Herberts who close down a part of London. People can't go and do their job, possibly go to hospital, keep appointments, see loved ones, whatever it might be. And the police say, can we get you a cup of coffee? How utterly pathetic of the police. Three weeks ago, you might recall, Buckingham Palace was the focus of national, if not global, attention. What would they have done then if Just Stop Oil had decided to go right across the mouth? They'd have said, can we get you a cup of coffee? And would you like some binoculars so you can see a bit more? Nick Ferrari at breakfast. With Motorway, where dealers compete to give you their best price for your car. LBC. Only. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. Eight minutes to nine on LBC. David Davis, Christine Jardine, Tim Stanley and Jamie Klingler with us answering your questions. Ben's in Clacton. Hello, Ben. Hello, Ian, and good evening, panel. Um, the question is, uh, should the government uh, allow families that are on universal credit the children to have free school meals? extend the free school meals to those people. That's what Jamie Oliver's been calling for, isn't it? Um, Tim? I, 
I'd, I'd want to hear the arguments one way or the other, but I have nothing against it in principle. I, I, times are going to be tough. Uh, Prices are going to be high. And uh, I, I just think the government's going to have to spend, spend, spend to get through the next 12 months. Jamie? If you're ever arguing for children to be hungry, you have no place in being in charge of anything. <laughs> Admirably concise, Christine? Oh, yeah. That, that, that puts it in a nutshell. We're in a situation where families are looking at their energy bills and thinking they can't afford to cook in the evening. So if the, the kids can get a hot meal at school... What, what are the restrictions on free school meals then? Because I, I, I mean, this comes as something as a surprise oh, that people on universal credit or kids whose families are on universal credit don't get free school meals. Well, it comes as a surprise to me as well because I, I can't see any justification for it. I think you've, you'll search long and hard before you will find people who will say that, um, you know, it is justified for um, families who are on universal credit for the children not to get um, not to get free school meals automatically. It just, in the situation we're in at the moment, it seems ridiculous. David? Yeah, well, I'm assuming, uh, like, like you, I don't know what the numbers say, but, uh, because I'm assuming that there's some sort of different criteria of poverty, but I think in this winter, mm. uh, feeding children is going to be critical. Um, just going back to the news that Angela Lansbury has died, Patrick has sent in an email saying, I've just realised that Liz Truss is the Lib Dems Manchurian candidate. <laughs> <laughs> Who is her controller? Oh, <laughs> who knows? Christine. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's go to, uh, Ben, thank you. Let's go to a text question from Farah in Wembley. The UK has today sanctioned Iran's morality police for its treatment of women during the protests there. How else should authorities here help these brave women and girls? Um, I don't know what form these sanctions take, but uh, Christine... I think um, we talked about this in the comments this afternoon um, and I, I'm reminded of a quote of Martin Luther King who said, none of us are free until we're all free. And I think anything we can do to support the women in Iran and show solidarity with them is, is vital. And one of the things which is playing an important part in this is BBC Persian service and I think one of the ways that we can help is that we can ensure that communication is getting through to the women and that there is um, information in Iran about the support uh, which is coming from out with Iran and from western countries so that they do not feel alone so that they know that they have our support and that we are with them and that we will do everything we can and that we'll be sanctioned but yes we do need to go further we need to look um, the, the government needs to look at all sorts of um, sanctions, Majinsky, Majitsky sanctions, which I can never say against Ma the Iranian... Thank you very much, David. <laughs> um, against the, the Iranian government. And, and just look um, and speak to the United Nations and see exactly how we can protect, help these women protect their, and gain in some cases, their, their human rights. Jamie, when you look at what's going on in Iran, it is quite inspirational, but it's very difficult to see what what we as a people, what we as a country can do to help them without being accused of intervening in yeah. the affairs of another country. Well, it's the day of the girl. So um, the the inspiration and the strength that I get and that I've that we've all gotten from watching those girls be the beacon of hope. You know, the the men and women in the Ukraine and the girls in Iran are kind of the shining light of what has to happen and that there is going to be change and it's got to give um so definitely stand with the young women and and the country that are fighting back finally david yeah well that's the point fighting back finally the first time since the shah we're seeing civil reaction and i love that it's coming from like it started with teenage well, there girls has, there has been um unrest in the past it seems to occur every 10 years but each time it it's, it's sort viciously of is, suppressed it's, it's what's happened yeah, exactly. uh, and what we have got to make plain to the iranians is any more of that and the sanctions will get worse whether magnitsky sanctions or other sorts of sanctions uh in in essence we've got to try and be no, not an interferer in their affairs, but something of a guardian of free speech and democracy. And that's, after all, our traditional role in the world, and we should make it plain to Iran that's what we'll do. And we're not going in and interfering. It has started in Iran, and it's, we can support it. Um, that's very different from going in and interfering in the first place. Do you, th do you think it's got enough media coverage in this country? 
I've seen tons of it, but I don't yeah. know if that's because my echo chamber is very focused on it. Mm. Um, I do think it's interesting that so many French women have come out in support of it, but the French are so anti people wearing burkas. So I think we also have to use it as a self reflective mirror and talk about women's choices and that women need to have choices across the board. Interesting you said that. I was I was on a panel at the weekend at a literary festival with someone who was wearing a hijab and we, we started talking about Iran and I wanted to say to her, why don't you take that off in support of the women of Iran? But I felt I couldn't. Oh no, but it, the whole point is that it mm. has to be about people's choice. Yeah, it's a very it has yeah. to be whether what they want to do and people in France shouldn't be telling people can't wear hijabs and people mm. in Iran shouldn't be telling young women they have to. Mm. And that's the point, is the, and, the choice. And that woman on that panel had the right to, to wear oh, no, she, she, yeah. And she was actually, it was her choice to do so. She right. wasn't someone who yes. was being repressed. Mm. I mean, let me make that clear, which I hadn't mentioned it now. Tim. <laughs> <laughs> there are certain circumstances under which I think it's fine to interfere. And that's when uh, you could make some difference, but also when it's actually in your strategic interests. It is not in our interest for Iran to get a nuclear weapon. It's not in our interest for Iran to uh, engage in terrorism across the Middle East. And it, it is pursuing nuclear weapons and it engages in terrorism. The rat reality is we are in some form of if you like cold war conflict with this country and we should be open about it uh, one thing we should do is walk away from the nuclear deal it's not working another thing we should do is support dissidents within the country obviously there are always problems around for instance the holding of dual nationals so you always have to tread carefully on these things but i think we should be far more activist about it but a key thing is we could do more to bolster so-called safe routes uh, for refugees into this country iranians make up a large number of people who cross the channel and the reason why they do that is because they report it's very difficult for them to get to the uk through safe routes uh, the UK government keeps saying it wants to reduce legal, illegal routes in order that people will travel through legal routes. What it's really doing is rather incompetently reducing illegal routes, but actually the, the, the so-called safe ones are very, very limited very indeed. Yes. Uh, so I, there are ways in which we could actively support these people rather than just tweeting about it. And I think the government should be open about its head-on conflict with Iran and where it stands in it. Uh, Sarah says, Ian, I must say this is the best panel I've heard for a long time. Please get them all back together again. Well, you haven't heard the answer to their final question yet, so let's reserve well, you, you, start, you started this by, by praising the fact you got a declaration of love from a robot at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> right, final fun text question from Sandra in Barnes. Damien Hurst has been burning hundreds of his own artworks as part of a stunt about NFTs, non-fungible tokens, I think they are. I personally wish he'd have done this rather sooner, if I'm honest. Is there any artist whose work the panel would like to destroy? Uh, well, there's some artists, Tracy Emin, where if you did, you um, wouldn't notice much you, of a difference. You beat me to it. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> Isn't it funny how the three right-wing people with. in the studio all came up with <laughs> Tracy bed Emin? Unmade to begin with. But I, I guess... Whether, you, whether you'd burn the unmade bed or just make it, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but if you burn Damien Hurst's Dam Dam work, uh, all you're doing, of course, is producing smoke mackerel, so... <laughs> oh. I don't get that, but then I've a cultural full of It's all fish and heart, oh, is it? isn't it? Yes, he's, right. he's basically a glorified fishmonger. With a I have heard of Damien <laughs> Hurst, but I wouldn't recognise anything that he'd done. Uh, Jamie? I live in Camden, and there was a new Banksy up on a wall near me, and the next day they tried to cover it with plastic, which then got seriously vandalised, which I quite amu was amused by Camden's reaction <laughs> to somebody trying to keep the value of a Banksy. So it's all good, uh, Good discourse. I think if you want to burn your own work, go for it. This Camden capitalism in action. <laughs> Christine. I'm coming out in a cold sweat at the thought of people bundling art. It just seems terrible. Um, because one of my favourite paintings was vandalised when I was a child and repaired, um, which is um, Christ of St John and the Cross by Salvador Dali, which mm. is in the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery in Glasgow. Mm. Um, and it was vandalised because someone thought the city had paid too much money for it. And now it's, it's priceless. So if artists want to destroy their own work as a statement, that's up to them. But the rest of us shouldn't pass comment or interfere because it's their art. Uh, are you moving beyond Tracy Emin, David <laughs> Davis? No, 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 no. You know, I used to work for the company that created the Tate Gallery. I've got to be suitably... Uh... <laughs> well, of course, she was a great fan of David Cameron, wasn't she? I think she voted Conservative when he was leaving. Who's she, you told me? Tracy Actually, you're oh, right. Tracy Emin, yes. There's, uh, yeah. in, in Downing Street, um, there's a Tracy Emin in installation. There was. I think Is that was removed down? by oh. Theresa May as soon as she became Prime Minister. Yeah, Am I not I, right? I you were in there all the time. I never saw it, so I assume yeah, I must think, be I right. Think yeah. I, th I think she had an idea of what tidiness should One be. One of like. the things <laughs> that we, most of us could approve of. Yeah. Uh, David Davis, Christine Jardine, Tim Stanley and Jamie Klinger, thank you very much indeed for joining us for the last hour. We have cro another cross-question at the same time tomorrow evening at 
8. It's two minutes past nine. Uh, we're going to be talking about the fact that the new health secretary is set to abandon launching new plans to tackle smoking. Is government at last getting out of our lives? Is the nanny state twitching or is it dead? Two minutes past nine. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock, the actress Damangela Lansbury has died at the age of 96.